So I'm sure most of you are pretty familiar with AFib, very common, uh, almost 6 million Americans with AFib. This is expected to double um, over the next 25 years. You see it on a daily basis here at the hospital. This gets more frequent as we get older. Um, the majority of patients are between 65, 60 and 75 years of age. About 2% of patients um, that have AFib are under the age of 65. 1% of patients, um, sorry, 9% of patients are over the age of 65. 1% of patients uh, with AFib are less than 60 years of age. I'm just gonna make one quick change here. One of the main reasons AFib is so common is that there's a lot of uh, associated risk factors which are very common in the community, hypertension, diabetes, uh, history of coronary artery disease, sleep apnea, obesity. Uh, so you see these things on a daily basis and all of these things are associated with an increased risk of developing AFib. AFib's not a nuisance rhythm as some people uh, really used to think. It doesn't really cause many problems. You just treat the heart rate and patients are fine, doesn't really cause any major issues. We know that it's associated with very frequent hospitalizations, associated with heart failure, dementia, and most importantly, especially for today, it's a very high risk factor for stroke. Five-fold risk increase in stroke if you have AFib. Also associated with a two-fold risk of mortality. This is the main reason why AFib is associated with stroke. You're looking at a TEE image here um, of the left atrium and the left atrial appendage. So this big goober here floating around in the left atrial appendage is a thrombus, and this can break off and cause a thromboembolic event, and most, um, most dangerously go into the brain and causing a stroke. Um, <clears throat> this is the main mechanism by which people with AFib develop strokes. Um, in patients that have AFib along with mitral stenosis, that stroke risk is even higher because you have a very dilated left atrium, very high risk of forming clots there. Um, thromboembolic events with AFib, strokes tend to cause more severe disability uh, and higher mortality than strokes that aren't associated with AFib, and this is largely the reason because you can form these huge clots, big territory of the brain that gets ischemic. Um, and this is uh, why the mainstay of treatment is really anticoagulation to eliminate this risk of thrombus formation. When we look at patients with AFib and we try and establish what their stroke risk is, not everybody has the same risk. We use these common risk scores, mainly the chads vast score, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. This looks at a number of risk factors, including age, hypertension, uh, the, the, the uh, presence of heart failure or vascular disease, diabetes, and it gives a patient a score uh, to help further determine how high risk they are for stroke. If you look, uh, we used to use a CHAD score, which um, didn't really uh, stratify patients at low risk too well, and so they found that by adding, um, by dropping the age requirement to 65 and adding vascular disease uh, as a risk factor, this was more predictive, particularly with low risk people. Um, <clears throat> So some of you may realize that if you're a woman and you're age 65 or older, that's gonna give you uh, two points right off the bat. Thank you. Okay. Oh, sorry. So if you're a woman with age 66, you're gonna have uh, two points on the CHAD score. And that's still not really high risk, and actually the most recent guidelines for, uh, for AFib haven't, um, have told us that if, that's, if you're a woman and your risk is two, you really don't meet the criteria for anticoagulation. So uh, really we're looking for a chads vast score of three in women or two um, in men to get your risk high enough where you would warrant anticoagulation. So we can know how to stratify patients in terms of their risk, and then what do we do about it? Uh, like I said, the mainstay is going to be anticoagulation. Uh, used to be primarily with warfarin or Coumadin. Now we try and use the, the novel anticoagulants uh, more, and we'll go over that. And then if a patient uh, can't be on anticoagulation or doesn't tolerate it, then we have ways to occlude the left atrial appendage itself so that clots don't form there. And I'm going to talk mostly about the Watchman device, which is what we use. <clears throat> 
The data for warfarin was pretty good. Um, definitely showed a significant improvement in the risk for ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke in patients with AFib. This is a meta-analysis of, of, of all the good data for um, warfarin early on. Uh, showed a 26% relative risk reduction in mortality. Um, did show higher bleeding risks, uh, particularly when you're getting uh, treatment initiated and in the elderly. So there was good data for warfarin. Now, the issue with warfarin, of course, is keeping the INR where it's supposed to be. Um, we have a lot of trials where these patients were watched closely, particularly when we're look, comparing it to some of the newer drugs. And we found that really only 55 to 64 percent of the time these patients are kept in a therapeutic range uh, of an INR of two to three, which is pretty dismal. And these are patients that are in clinical trials being watched closely, so it's probably even worse out in the community. And it really is a pretty um, narrow treatment window here. If your INR is less than two, that stroke risk really doesn't come down. Once you get that INR above three and a half and four, that bleeding risk really takes off, so it it's, can be difficult uh, to keep them in that narrow window. Talk about aspirin for a minute. A lot of patients are put on aspirin for stroke risk reduction in AFib, and I'll show you there's really not a lot of data to support that, and guidelines over the last several years have really um, shown that aspirin's fallen out of favor uh, for low risk patients for stroke risk reduction. Most of the data that was there was from this meta analysis, and actually, most of the meta analysis uh, data that was positive came from this one SPAF1 trial, uh, which had multiple design problems and really wasn't a great trial. It was stopped early. And if you look at the other trials that looked at aspirin um, for stroke reduction, it really wasn't too great. Um, there is a modest benefit in stroke reduction, and that's probably more related to the effect on vascular disease, which you'll probably hear more about later, as opposed to actually stopping clots forming when you're in AFib. Um, it hasn't really been studied in the low-risk population with AFib that people tend to use it for, uh, and there's actually data out there that show worse outcomes in low-risk patients with AFib, higher bleeding risks. Um, the bleeding risk of a Full dose aspirin is not insignificant, and there's some trials out there that show it's even as high as being on full dose anticoagulation. So you're really getting the bleeding risk without getting much stroke risk reduction benefit if you're just using aspirin. Again, like I mentioned, the guidelines have really sort of uh, gotten away from, from recommending aspirin. If a patient's low risk based on their CHADS, then they recommend omitting antithrombotic therapy altogether. Uh, if a patient's low risk but has a score of one, they can be considered. Um, and then really, you know, and some of the newer guidelines, they straight up say don't recommend it as monotherapy for people with atrial fibrillation. So I, I don't really use it uh, unless they need to be on aspirin for more of a vascular indication. We'll talk a little bit about the novel oral anticoagulants. Uh, so these, this is rivaroxaban, apixaban, dabigatran. Um, that you guys are, I'm sure, familiar with. The big trials uh, that looked at these, comparing them to warfarin, were several years ago now, but this is where all the FDA approval data come from, primarily. There's a lot of data to look at with these, and there's more coming out every day when they look at registry and real-world data for all these drugs. I think the bottom line is, t is uh, to remember that they're all better than warfarin. Uh, primarily, in, if you look at intracranial hemorrhage or hemorrhagic stroke, um, they all do remarkably better than warfarin, uh, which is, of course, the most feared complication. If you look at ischemic stroke reduction, um, put in happy face form, if you look at ischemic stroke reduction, uh, Pradaxa was really the only one that showed a, a, a significant benefit, but they're all at least as good as warfarin. Again, hemorrhagic stroke, they're all better. Um, <clears throat> Pixaban had some mortality benefit, intracranial bleeding, uh, I just mentioned was better. GI bleeding, apixaban, tends to be uh, considered a little bit better than the other two. Again, there's, this data is changing all the time. They're constantly um, looking at this. And uh, actually, some of the real world data I go over is this study, um, astrophenes. And uh, this is a big retrospective observational study from big uh, payers, Medicare, and four commercial uh, insurance companies looking at over 300,000 patients. Uh, and this was done like a propensity match uh, type of situation where they compared, uh, they sort of matched groups and then compared all three to warfarin and then all three against each other. Uh, and the data was pretty much consistent, it's tough to see, but it's pretty consistent with what we had from 
uh, the early randomized trials. Essentially, if you look at, uh, this is looking at risk of stroke or systemic embolism, they are all better than warfarin. If you look at bleeding, uh, again, they're all better than warfarin here, except uh, in this particular study, rivaroxaban was sort of equivalent to warfarin. Um, I'll let you decide who, or figure out who paid for this study, but Eliquis was a lot better, and uh, so was Pradaxa. If you, this is the slide showing the NOACs against each other. Um, if you look at stroke, you know, this is um, Eliquis versus Pradaxa, Eliquis versus Zarelto, and Pradaxa versus Zarelto. They're all pretty much equivalent, which is, you know, what I tell patients. Really, when we're making decisions about what medication to use for individual patients, Honestly, a lot of it comes down to what their insurance will pay for because they're all on different, um, you know, they're different uh, tiers depending on the coverage. And uh, if once, you know, Zarelto is once a day, which is helpful for some patients. The other two are twice a day. Uh, but they're all important to remember that they're all much better than warfarin if you can get a patient on them. Okay, so a watchman really came along as an alternative uh, to anticoagulation. Of course, the biggest issue with being on anticoagulation is the increased risk of bleeding. And a lot of these patients are older, frail, multiple comorbidities, GI bleeding, frequent falls. And so it's not safe to keep them on anticoagulation necessarily. And we're putting them at big risk for stroke. So, you know, the, the hypothesis was, well, if you can close off that atrial appendage area where clots are forming and not allow clots to form or embolize from there, can you reduce the stroke risk as well as anticoagulation? If you look at these registries, the, the um, compliance rate with anticoagulation really isn't that great. And it's compliance as well as prescribing patterns from physicians. Uh, it's still out there in the community, uh, amazing amount of patients that should be on anticoagulation based on their stroke risk are not for various reasons. This is, if you look at this graph, this is looking at patients on either warfarin or a NOAC. And if you look at these higher CHAD scores, at three, four, five, you know, you're barely above 50% of patients that are appropriately anticoagulated, and this is for a number of different reasons. They may have bleeding issues. They may have perceived risks of falls and things like that. Uh, it may be patient noncompliance for, you know, all of these different reasons that nobody likes to be on a blood thinner. But for whatever reason, um, it was clear that in some patients we need to have an alternative or else they're at big risk. Even with the NOACs uh, being much easier to take and tolerate than warfarin, they still find that about 30% of patients on NOACs stop taking them for various reasons at two years. So that's a big number. <clears throat> so that's where the, you know, the Watchman um, and devices like the Watchman sort of came in. If you look at the FDA labeling for the device, it's pretty broad um, initially. You know, it's looking at basically anybody that's at an increased risk of stroke um, and are recommended to be an anticoagulation. They're felt to be suitable. Um, for warfarin, but have an appropriate rationale to seek a non-pharmacologic alternative. So that's pretty vague and broad. Um, it leaves a lot of room for interpretation as to who really would qualify for a, for a watchman. Uh, once Medicare, you know, approved it and, and got their reimbursement coverage, it's a little more specific. So they do put a, um, a you know, a, a more objective look at stroke risk with a CHAD score of two or a CHAD VASC of three. They want some kind of formal decision making done between the patient and a referring or a physician that's not involved in the, um, in the implant. And then again, they need to be suitable for short-term anticoagulation with warfarin, but felt to be high risk for long-term anticoagulation. And I'll go over why that is that they need to be able to take short-term warfarin. So we'll stop for, whoop, for a little video time. So this is, what the watchman device looks like, obviously an animation, um, comes in different sizes depending on uh, the size of the left atrium. It's very, there's a lot of variation in left atrial size and anatomy between patients, so it comes in five different sizes, which we try and uh, size beforehand with TEE. It's a standard uh, venous access and transeptal um, access, which we'll go through here. So again, they're going through looking at the different atrial appendage morphologies and anatomy. Osteo size varies a lot with patients, um, and the anatomy is very variable as well. 
So they do a standard transeptal like we do for all left atrial procedures like AFib ablation, Watchman. Um, we get access there with their with a regular transeptal sheath. We go up with, they have a special sheath here uh, for delivery of the Watchman device, which helps to size it when you're in there. We're going to talk about the, they have a few different names for the different types of anatomy, always food related. So you got your broccoli and chicken wing. Okay, the windsock is the most common and the most straightforward. Uh, not a lot of acute bends and turns. You get the sheath positioned in the, uh, in the appendage. Those are markers to help you size. The bigger device you need for the ostium, the more room you actually need to be able to deliver it, uh, which can be a problem sometimes, depending on the anatomy. So once it's sized, you inject contrast, you get a good look where your sheet's positioned. Hello. Okay, so then the actual watchman is brought up through the sheath and aligned to the tip there. Once you have it in position and then you essentially pull back on the sheath, it self-deploys um, and it's held in place at the ostium of the, of the uh, appendage by a couple of things. There's tiny little tines actually at the, at the circumference of it to help it stay. And then it's also, you should, you, we size it so that there's some, uh, it's not fully deployed, but the appendage is actually holding it in place uh, so it's compressed. Um, and we do all, we measure all that before we release it. And then after about six weeks, it's fully endothelialized and the appendage is um, essentially excluded. Okay. Any questions about that or anything? <clears throat> so if we look at the data for the Watchman, it's actually a really well-studied device in terms of randomized trials. It's been around for a long time. They started testing these uh, in, in randomized trials in 2005. Um, there were a few issues with early trials. They had to end up doing another randomized trial before it got FDA approved. So the Protect AF, CAP, and Prevail are all sort of similar uh, trials. Um, and then it got uh, approval after CAP2. Um, this evolution study is, a, is one that looked at, uh, didn't take place in North America, so this actually looked at patients at higher risk of bleeding that couldn't be on any kind of anticoagulation. So we got some useful data, data out of that that I'll go over. Um, but overall, we're looking at over 3,000 patients that are in uh, randomized controlled trials with this device. So um, FDA approved, I think around 2000, 15, 14, or 15, but it's been studied for uh, much longer than that. The patients in these studies generally are pretty high risk. If you look at the, the CHAD score in these patients, the majority are three or a four, which is, which is high stroke risk. Uh, also high bleeding risk scores. The has bled score is uh, similar to the CHAD score in that it gives us a little bit more objective risk of bleeding, and these, you know, the majority of these patients have high bleeding uh, risk for obvious reasons. And if we look at data here from all these studies and meta-analysis form, um, basically they're all, it's at least as good, these are all, uh, sorry, these, all these studies compared the Watchman to Warfarin, which was standard of care at the time that these studies were being done. And they're all, you know, non-inferior or uh, at least favor uh, Watchman for the, for the majority of these things. Um, if you look at, you know, all stroke or systemic embolism, they're about even. Um, hemorrhagic stroke, as expected, is much better in Watchman because you're getting these patients off of blood thinners. Um, the ischemic stroke is interesting in this study because some of, there were some ischemic strokes early on in some of the first studies, which were actually due to procedural issues and issues with the sheath, and there were a couple of embolic events, unfortunately, uh, so that did skew the data a little bit uh, on the ischemic stroke side. Um, all the bleeding uh, parameters favor Watchman as most of these patients, almost all these patients get off anticoagulation. <clears throat> if you look at Watchman compared to no therapy, which is really what most of these patients are looking at in the real world because they can't be on anticoagulation for whatever reason, you have a really marked improvement in uh, stroke risk reduction. 
And if you look at, um, again, disabling uh, or you know, really major strokes, which is obviously what we're mostly trying to avoid, there's a significant, very significant reduction in disabling or fatal strokes with the watchman. Again, because you're, even if it's not a 100% perfect um, deployment of the device, you're always going to at least occlude the majority of the appendage, so those really big clots that I showed you before can't form and break off. So, you know, even if you have a, some TIAs, uh, you know, is, isn't good, but the serious major strokes are, are drastically reduced. So this, this graph on the top uh, sort of explains how we, how we do these patients um, around surrounding implant and then after. Um, generally, after we put the device in, we want the patients on warfarin along with aspirin for six weeks while that uh, device is actually endothelializing. Um, the thought being that you can still form some microclots on that on the device itself, so if they can be anticoagulated, that's ideal. After 45 days, we do another TEE to look at the device, make sure it's well endothelialized and the appendage itself is sealed, there's no leaks around it. And if that looks good, which the vast majority of the time it's fine, um, then we stop warfarin at that point and the patients are on dual antiplatelet therapy for six months and after six months they just remain on aspirin. Okay, and um, again, so this is looking at, uh, at bleeding risk once these patients, you know, at the early stage when they're on warfarin, it's about the same as warfarin as would be expected. Once they come off the warfarin after the six week point, you have a dramatic reduction in bleeding risk when they're on, uh, when they have a watchman compared to staying on Coumadin. And that's looking at the same stuff. So this was this, these are, these are all those early studies I was telling you about, so, and this is looking at safety and complication rates. So this, the first half of the first trial to protect had, a, had an elevated, you know, almost 10% complication rate. Again, this was a lot of the, the skewedness was um, mostly due to procedural issues and, and ischemic strokes. Um, once that got, you know, addressed, uh, there is the um, complication rate came down a lot and going through the different trials here, the most recent trial being a 2.8% complication rate. In the PREVAIL trial, um, this was primarily new operators doing this, so it's not like it was the same people doing the early studies that got better and now the complication rate's a lot better. These were actually all new operators and, and had a very low complication rate. And if you look at what the actual complications were, again, early on, up, up, whoops, over almost a four percent or over four percent tamponade rate, uh, procedure-related stroke up to one percent. Again, as the trials went on, this this all got much better. Um, like anything else, as they worked out the kinks, um, so to speak, got much better. And if you look at post FDA approval, over three thousand patients, the tamponade rate's about one percent. Uh, device embolization, stroke, or even death is is very very low. So just a word about this evolution study. Um, this, this is interesting because it's, it's done, it's, it's in Europe, Russia, and the Middle East, wasn't done in North America. And uh, that was helpful because in North America, these patients, like you saw the FDA labeling, all have to be able to take warfarin for a short period of time after it's implanted. That wasn't the case in, in, in these countries. And so this was looking at really high risk bleeding patients that couldn't even tolerate to be on a short course of anticoagulation. So if you look at, at the patients in this study, 73% um, of them had a contraindication to any anticoagulation. So they were basically getting this watchman um, without any anticoagulation protection afterwards. Um, and they ha still had very, very good results. The ischemic, if you look at, you know, this, the ischemic stroke risk based on their expected risk, based on their CHAD score, uh, compared to their actual risk when they got the device, it's down dramatically, 84% and 85% for ischemic stroke or any embolism, um, even despite not being able to take anticoagulation right after. And again, on the bleeding risk side, of course, it's gonna be a lot better. So while it's the indications and the, and, um, the, the labeling is very clear that patients should be on anticoagulation for six weeks after, we, you know, there is some data out there to suggest that if you have to stop it for whatever reason, a major GI bleed a week after implant or whatever the situation is, um, there is data to suggest it's safe and they're still going to do well. <laughs>
Um, and then they're looking, so that was a study obviously not in North America. This ASAP2 trial is, is sort of a randomized trial looking at patients just like this who are really not a candidate for um, anticoagulation. We're actually looking at this study potentially to bring it here as well. They're having a little bit of trouble with enrollment um, for various reasons, but they're looking at this exact patient population, high risk, can't be on anticoagulation, um, randomized to a watchman or, or, or nothing basically. All right, so just to sort of sum up the watchman side of this, you know, very safe procedure, very high rate of success when implanting with a low risk of complications, um, comparable to warfarin in terms of efficacy and reducing stroke risk, significant reduction in disabling strokes and hemorrhagic strokes, um, major bleeding significantly reduced, and we're able to get just about all the patients off of warfarin once it's implanted. So I'm going to sort of change gears a little bit and uh, talk about um, detecting AFib in patients that have already had a stroke um, in the cryptogenic stroke population. Does anyone want to have any questions or anything about Watchmen or anything so far? Okay. Good. So if we look at AFib and how it presents clinically, um, there's a wide range of symptoms, anything from palpitations, which are common, to patients being dizzy, lightheaded. Uh, passing out, fatigue is a big one, uh, but a lot of times it's completely asymptomatic. You, you, know, you see a patient in AFib picked up in their doctor's office or when they go for their first colonoscopy um, and they happen to be on a monitor, an EKG, and they really had no idea. Um, so that's important because if someone's asymptomatic, it doesn't get picked up for a long time. You start to, you can see the, um, the sequelae of untreated AFib with electrical remodeling and structural remodeling in the, in the atrium. And then they're also at an increased, you know, depending on the patient, they could be at an increased risk of stroke without even knowing it because no one's picked up the AFib. Oops. You're gonna hear a lot about stroke today, which is not my specialty, but um, the majority of strokes are ischemic and we're always working up the cause of the stroke, particularly, you know, as an inpatient when they come in. And, it, and a lot of the time, it's considered cryptogenic. 30 to 40% of the time, there's no clear cause um, for an ischemic stroke. And this is where AFib probably plays a big role. Um, I'm sure most of you know what a cryptogenic stroke is, basically a stroke with has no clear, work, uh, no clear uh, etiology after a pretty extensive workup, looking at large and small vessel atherosclerosis um, and any other secondary causes. So again, 30% of strokes are considered uh, cryptogenic. Uh, intermittent AFib or atrial flutter that's asymptomatic is, can be seen in up to 30% of these patients. And it's very important. If these patients have, uh, have had a stroke and they're found to have AFib, then they're gonna have an indication for anticoagulation. They're gonna be at uh, high risk for recurrent strokes. And so being able to uh, make that diagnosis really plays a big role in their future management. So there's always a question about how much AFib does someone have to have to, to put you at a risk for stroke, and this has really evolved over the last you know couple decades. Really, um, I think the traditional teaching for a long time was if someone's been in AFib less than 48 hours, you really don't have that risk of stroke. Go ahead and cardiovert them, and they're going to be fine. And we know that's really not the case. You can you can be at risk of stroke uh, pretty quick, um, and I'll show you some data that uh, looks at how much AFib you have to have to really show an increased risk of stroke. First sort of study to look at this uh, was the TREND study. This was looking at almost 2,500 patients that have implantable devices, pacemakers or defibrillators, which of course can detect AFib, whether it's um, symptomatic or not. And they, they sort of cut these off into a high AFib burden, which was more than five and a half hours, a low AFib burden, which was less than five and a half hours, or no AFib at all. And they looked at these patients' risks for thromboembolic <laughs> events. And in this study, they found that if you have a, what they considered a low burden of AFib, less than five and a half hours, your risk was pretty much the same as having no AFib at all. But if you have even five and a half hours, your risk is over double. Okay, so this, is, this study was now f over 10 years old. Um, but uh, the conclusion on this study was that more than five and a half hours doubles your risk of, uh, of thromboembolic events. 
The ASSERT trial uh, was a little more stringent, so this was again almost 3,000 patients with implantable devices, uh, no prior history of AFib, and looking at just more than six minutes of atrial tachycardia or AFib, and then they went ahead and followed these patients for two and a half years. Interestingly, 10% um, of these patients were found to have an episode of subclinical AFib based on that criteria and there was a significant increase in the risk of stroke or systemic embolism, again, almost two and a half times, uh, with just six minutes of AFib. So it's very important to be looking for this, particularly in patients that have had a cryptogenic stroke, given how um, prevalent AFib is. Um, again, symptoms can be very rare or um, non-existent, and so we really need to uh, find a way to detect this in patients um, to intervene at an earlier time. So there's different ways that we monitor, you know, patients come in with a stroke, they're on telemetry for maybe a couple of days, and um, you have that way to look at things. As an outpatient, we have, of course, Holter monitors, and we do a lot of these. We have event recorders that can be on for about 30 days, which automatically um, will, you know, pick up any arrhythmias, including AFib. We have mobile uh, cardiac telemetry monitors, which are not just picking up uh, what the device determines to be an arrhythmia, but are monitoring every beat, uh, again, for up to 30 days. And then there's implantable cardiac monitors, which are loop recorders, uh, which we'll talk more about that, that are in, that can monitor the heart rhythm for years. <clears throat> and then some newer toys that uh, are coming with the, you know, better technology is uh, that patients can do on their own. This Alive Core is a, is a great little tool that I give to a lot of patients. Um, it's basically an app and a little tool for your phone that lets you get a pretty decent looking uh, rhythm strip of an EKG um, by putting your fingers on it. Um, it's a hundred bucks on, uh, on Amazon and I, you know, we use it a lot for different reasons but particularly to look for any AFib that may be very sparse and intermittent. And then even now, we're using a lot of Apple Watch technology. Uh, again, it can pick up an EKG with a couple of fingers. It's on the patient all the time um, and gives pretty decent rhythm strips of the EKGs, which are, which are um, pretty w interpretable. Um, the one downside, not the one downside, but something to remember with the Apple Watch is that it's not constantly taking an EKG. It's not like wearing an event monitor, you know, that's looking at your EKG all the time. The patient has to actually touch the watch and, and do it uh, to get an EKG reading, so you can still miss things with that. So one thing we found is the more we look in these patients, the more we find. And um, if you look at diagnostic yield of putting a monitor on someone for 24 hours compared to having them wear a 30-day mobile telemetry, it's, it's, it's vastly improved the longer you look. And I'll show you some other data, um, particularly with loop recorders that show you can pick up these AFib episodes sometimes years later. Um, so this was looking, if you, if you de depending on how you define um, AFib in these patients, a, the majority of these are gonna be asymptomatic. So a lot of these early studies, again, looked at very, very small amounts of AFib by different means. Most of these in the later studies had devices so they were looking all the time. And if you look at anybody having more than, you know, a minute or two of AFib, 80 to 90 percent of these episodes are asymptomatic. So you really can't rely on a patient's symptoms to tell you if they're going to be, if they're having AFib or not, which is what that slide was about. Um, so other ways is to sort of intermittently monitor a patient by putting a Holter monitor on or a seven-day event monitor. And again, you know, that's, that's not a great way to look at either. If you look at this is an interesting study that looked at patients that are known to have AFib that have pacemakers, and if you sort of look at how their AFib burden is, these black lines are, are, are up to the hours of how much AFib a patient's having, and if you just sort of, if you were to just randomly once a month have them wear a 24-hour Holter monitor, you would likely end up missing this AFib. And um, so intermittent monitoring is not very helpful to pick that up. Again, a lot of data here looking that the shorter, you know, short-term monitoring is going to miss a lot of AFib. If you look at these patients that were monitored for up to a year, um, the vast majority of it is out past seven days and 30 days. 
if you even did a 30-day event monitor, 60% of these patients that ended up having AFib, it wouldn't have been caught. Okay, so and then if you look at now continuous monitoring for a longer period of time with a loop recorder, um, your, your detection rates and the time to diagnosis is very interesting. So this is looking at you know, seven or eight studies of loop recorders um, for anything more than most of these studies are two to five minutes. Um, first of all, very high rates of detection of AFib in these patients. And if you look at the average time to diagnosis, uh, most of them are up over 100 days, you know, three months or longer uh, from when they get the device. So really showing that putting a 21 or 30 day event monitor is gonna miss a lot of AFib. This crystal AF study was, uh, was a pretty seminal paper here in the New England Journal looking at particularly loop recorders in cryptogenic stroke patients. They looked at both a six and a 12 month uh, endpoint and then later on actually looked at the 36 month endpoint uh, to figure out how many patients with cryptogenic stroke went on to have AFib uh, based on a loop recorder greater than 40 years of age, you know, they had a stroke deemed to be cryptogenic after basic workup. They are basically randomized to either getting a loop recorder uh, or standard of care, which is intermittent EKGs, intermittent holters, et cetera. And then they looked to see how many patients ended up being diagnosed with AFib and how long it took to make the diagnosis. <clears throat> so if we look at the six month data, um, the standard group, only one and a half percent of patients were diagnosed with AFib. Um, this is done by EKGs or Holter monitors, only one event recorder. Most of these are actually asymptomatic. And if you look at the uh, loop recorder group, over eight percent of patients were found to have AFib. Um, again, the majority of them being asymptomatic. So right away at six months, we're picking up way more of these patients that actually have AFib with a loop recorder. If you carry that out to 12 months, it separates even more. You've only picked up 2% AFib in, in patients that are in standard care, and you've, and you've seen it in 12% of patients that have a loop recorder. And um, then they did, they did publish the 36-month data, which again shows ongoing you know, um, improvement or continuing to pick up new AFib even up to three years um, in these patients. Median time to detection, 250 days. So I think there's a, there's a lot of data out there to support longer term monitoring for patients that have AFib um, if you're looking for stroke. There's any patients that have a stroke if you're looking for AFib. All right. And interestingly, they looked at to try, so when they found that all these patients were having AFib, they went back and looked at it to see is there anything that could have predicted which patients went on to have AFib and which didn't. Uh, and sort of surprisingly, there really wasn't much that predicted it aside from age and the PR interval. If you look at their CHAD score or other sort of cardiac risk factors, it didn't correlate with a higher risk of developing AFib um, compared to not having them. And they also went back and looked at, well, maybe we can look at the type of stroke they had beforehand. And does that uh, predict who actually has AFib and who doesn't? And uh, it did not either. So there's really no good way beforehand to decide uh, in patients that have a cryptogenic stroke, you know, you're pretty high risk for having, you may be having AFib, we should put a loop in, you probably don't have AFib, you probably don't need anything, it's, it, you really can't make that determination up front. And the guidelines have, are evolving to support this uh, in, the, in the 2016 European guidelines. Uh, they give it a class 2A recommendation for uh, long-term monitoring with an uh, event monitor or an implantable loop recorder for patients that have cryptogenic stroke. So to sort of summarize the data for, for loop recorders in, in uh, stroke patients, um, it detects low burden and asymptomatic AFib. It's a much higher yield than standard 7-day or 30-day monitors. Again, there's no real way to predict who, which patients are going to have AFib and which won't and it is cost effective. I'll show you another video here real quick. These things are also very, very quick and easy to put in with basically zero to no risk to patients. They're actually done in the office now primarily uh, and they take all of about a minute and a half to do. A uh, little bit of lidocaine uh, in that area in the fourth intercostal space. This is a Medtronic um, loop recorder but there are multiple, there's 
three companies that have very similar devices, which are all going pretty similarly. Come with a little scalpel tool, make the, make the little incision after you've numbed the area. <clears throat> Don't stab your thumb. Comes sort of on this little dilator kit that once you advance this, it makes a little subcutaneous pocket for the device. Once you turn it over, that makes the room, makes some room for the device. <coughs> it's quicker than the video to do this thing. Okay, so then it's ready to go in. It has a little delivery tool. Pushes it right under the skin and it's in place. And then you don't even really need a stitch. You basically, it's a tiny little incision that you can close with uh, skin glue. Okay. And that's it. So that's it for me. These are my kids. And uh, that was my daughter's birthday at Disney where she got to see princesses. So she was really happy. My son was not as excited to be there. <laughs> That's it. Happy to take any questions or anything else that I didn't cover you guys want to talk about? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's definitely, there is data out there that they're linked to a lot of arrhythmias, SVT, uh, atrial tac, and AFib. Um, I've had several patients that were you know, drinking a lot of that stuff, and, and once they stopped, things got a lot better. Um, I think that's a lot of the high energy, like those energy drinks, it's more than just the caffeine. They have other supplements and things that have been shown to be proarrhythmic. In general, with caffeine and AFib patients, I usually tell them just to be reasonable, you know, with a cup of coffee in the morning, but not to really push it. Yes. Why do the patients need anti-platelet agents like you would for, you know, the dual anti-platelet like you would for a stent if the idea is to exclude that appendage? So the dual anti-platelet is for the first six months while you're getting full um, endothelialization of the device. So it's sort of the same idea like when you put a stent in, the, in an artery uh, until that stent's been endothelialized and there's exposed hardware there's always the theoretical risk of developing clots on the, on the device itself. So that's the main reason you do the dual antiplatelet for six months. Same like when you do a TAVR or a bioprosthetic valve. Um, it's just to avoid it, you know, until, until it uh, is fully healed and, and covered. Uh, to well, but with this, you're starting it after the initial six weeks because you start with Coumadin and aspirin. Right? Correct. Yeah, so the first six weeks, Coumadin, while it's, you know, very exposed, um, after six weeks, it's pretty well endothelialized, um, so that's why it's comfortable to come off of anticoagulation, but the dual antiplatelet, again, you know, a lot of these, these regimens come from how the original trials were designed, uh, and then they get FDA approval based on that. Um, whether or not, you know, if you stop, pla I, I don't get too excited if a patient has to stop Plavix early, you know, it, I think the risk is pretty low. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you.